grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Be you always here, or be this your first time, welcome. Welcome into this community of faith. Welcome into this community of love. If you are visiting this morning, please say hello to somebody. If you are always here, please say hello to somebody you don't recognise. It's wonderful to see so many people gathered here this morning. So many family and friends of Kirsty and myself, both new and old. Today we celebrate our little baby's christening. Um, I apologise, at some point I'm likely to cry during the service. <laughs> I think you all know that's likely to happen. Um, actually, no, I don't apologise. I warn you. <laughs> Following the service, there will be sandwiches and cake and tea and coffee in the Chalmers Hall. If you don't know where that is, it's kind of that direction. If you still can't find it, follow somebody and you'll eventually find it. Kirsty and I would like to say a huge thanks to the social team who've done the catering for the post-service celebration this morning. In, uh, in doing this, they've allowed us to continue celebrating God's love in all of our lives, but particularly in little Zoe's life this morning, in chat and food after the service. There will be a donations plate in the Chalmers Hall for the United Nations Population Fund, which seeks to deliver a world where every pregnancy is wanted, every birth is safe, and every young person's potential is fulfilled. To accomplish this, the UNFPA works to ensure that all people, especially women and young people, are able to access high quality sexual and reproductive health services, including family planning, so that they can make informed and voluntary choices about their sexual and reproductive lives. Kirsty and I would also like to say thank you all so very much for the support that we've had, not just in the last five weeks, but since we've got here. But particularly since the birth of Zoe, we again have been overwhelmed by the generosity and love that we have been shown in so very many ways. Thank you all. We're getting to the end of these announcements, you'll be glad to hear. This morning, it is my great pleasure to be sharing the service with the Reverend Alistair McMillan. He is the minister of Cathcart Trinity Church in Glasgow. I had the pleasure of studying with Alistair at New College and Kirsty worked with Alistair during his training. He is a dear friend to us both and it is a pleasure to have you here baptizing Zoe. Thank you. And the final thing is a mistake that I've made. In the order of service, it says the reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians, it is not. It is from 2 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. So, it's the right chapter and verse, just the wrong book. Happily, that's enough of that. Let us take a moment and still ourselves as we come to worship Almighty God. Come, all those who are perfect. Come, all those who shine with God's love. Come, all who live in peace with themselves. Come, all those lives that are tarnished. All those who shy away from God's love. Come, all those with dirt in their lives. Come, all of us. The one who loves us. All of us loved no more than another, all equal, all forgiven, all treasured and loved. Come, let us worship the God of forgiveness, our God who meets us here, our God whose love is great. We stand as we are able, singing together hymn 154, <coughs> O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder Thy hand 
have made and see the Let us bow in humble adoration. Let us pray. Thanks be to you, O God, everlasting to everlasting. Thanks be to you for your love, your mercy, your grace. We gather as the very people who have let you down. Us, the gossipers and the greedy the judgmental and the jealous, the selfish and the secretive. 
we are the ones you came to forgive. From our turning a blind eye to injustice. From our deciding that mercy can wait. From our desire to serve or loathe self. Have mercy upon us today as we wrestle with the difficulty of forgiveness. We know we need to be forgiven, Lord. We know we need to forgive others. In our worship this morning, speak to us. Through those around us. Through your word. Through your spirit moving amongst us. Open our ears and open our eyes. Open our hearts and open our minds. That forgiveness might become second nature to us. Somehow learning to let go of the wrongs committed against us. Let go of the guilt from our own wrongs committed against others. Thanks be to you, O God, everlasting to everlasting. Your love is eternal. Your mercy is never ending. Your grace really is amazing. In seeking forgiveness, we are forgiven. In forgiving others, we are forgiven. Reconciled to you and to our community. And as part of that community, we pray together the words that Jesus taught, printed in the order of service. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, hello. How are you all doing? Good. I'm really excited to be here. Um, this, this isn't where I normally work, is it? No, I, I don't look like Dan. I don't have a beard <laughs> or anything like that. Yeah, no, completely different. Now, did you hear who Dan said I was? Not, not maybe my name, but how does Dan know me? Yeah? I, I'm not his best friend, but I'm a good friend of his. <laughs> Dan, has, Dan has lots of good friends. Yeah, we studied together. And I'm here because we're doing something really special today. Do you, do you know what we're doing today? Yeah? Yeah, we're baptizing baby Zoe. Who's excited that we're baptizing baby Zoe? <laughs> yeah, look, look around. Lots of the grown-ups as well. Right. So I was thinking on my way here today, what, what do we need to baptize baby Zoe? What, what all do we need? Well, could we do it without Zoe? No, no. Okay, so, so we need Zoe. What else do we need? We do need water. That is great, because what do, what do we do with the water? Put it on the baby's head, yeah. I'm going to very carefully, a wee bit later on, put a, a cross gently on Zoe's head with water. And that is, that is a sign of the promises that we're making in the baptism. This is really exciting. But it got me thinking a bit about water, because we need, we need Zoe, we need water, we need, um, we need Dan and Kirsty as well, because they're going to make promises, and we need me. But I was thinking, let's, let's go back to the water. Water is an amazing thing. Why, why do we need water? Not for baptism generally, but just why do we need water? Yeah. To drink. Yeah. Have you ever been thirsty? Yeah. And they're like, Mom, Dad, I need a drink. I'm so thirsty. Yeah. I'm like that as well. Just <laughs> I need a drink. I need water. In fact, there's water behind the table. Dan, would you mind passing me some water? I'm not going to have any just now, but what would happen? If I continued to pour water in this, what would happen? Yeah. 
it would overflow. Do you think I might get into trouble if I kept pouring water and water and water and it overflowing? <laughs> yeah. Normally, I would get into trouble for it, and that's why I'm not doing it. I don't know <laughs> the people here well enough to think, well, will I get away with this? Or are they going to get upset that their lovely carpet at the front here has got loads and loads of water on it? But it got me thinking that sometimes baptism is like that with the water. Because we only use a tiny bit of water, don't we, in baptism? Other churches use a lot, lot more. But we use a wee bit of water. But the thing is, despite it just being a little bit, it spreads everywhere. I'm going to let you into a secret. There's a house that I know quite well that I discovered water coming in a wall. Do you think it was from the wall itself? No. I had to trace it back to work out where it was coming from. And it was coming from somewhere completely different because the water gets everywhere. Now that's the thing with baptism as well. The water there looks a small amount. It looks just like it's on the forehead and nowhere else. But the thing is that I'm going to ask some of the grown-ups here, which of you here, and you as well, boys and girls, which of you here was baptised or christened when you were younger? Put your hand up. Turn around and look around. It's amazing, isn't it? All these people. And that little bit of water and the fact that it's got a promise that God is with them wasn't just for that moment, but has been with them for their whole life and will be. So water is an amazing thing. It's about keeping us so that we're not thirsty. It's about giving us life. And when we think about the baptism, we remember that actually that water goes everywhere and it lasts us for our whole life. I'll pass this back to you, Dan. And when I've done that, we will get back to the scripts. So we are here to gather together for the celebration of the baptism of Zoe. Is she asleep, Kirsty? Are they excellent? <laughs> we we baptise, remembering that Jesus himself was baptised in the River Jordan. It's a really special story in the Bible, seeing that. But we also baptise because Jesus asked us to do it. He said to his first friends and followers, go out into all the world and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we baptize because we remember that we are sharing in a new life with Jesus Christ. We trust in him as the source of all life and love, and we gather to celebrate Zoe through the sacrament of baptism. In the sacrament of baptism, we affirm the unique and precious being of Zoe and ask God's blessing on her and on her family and friends as they love for her and as they care for her. We also trust in the power of forgiveness to help Zoe move through hard times in her life. Those times that the world would say to her, she's got it wrong or is messed up. Those times that she'll feel sad and discouraged. And in that, find moments of hope, the possibility of being alive and open to new possibilities. I'm going to ask Dan and Kirsty to come to the front, or to this area anyway. Stand here, front, that's great. And if the congregation are able, I would invite you to stand. I'll stand side on so you can see what's going on too. First of all, a question for Kirsty and Dan. Do you desire to have your child baptised into the Christian community and to the worldwide church of Jesus Christ? We do. Excellent. Will you encourage Zoe to learn from the wisdom of the prophets, doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with her God? We do. Will you foster for Zoe an appreciation for the life and teachings of Jesus Christ? We will. Excellent. Will you teach Zoe to honour her faith by asking and seeking answers to the questions that arise in the course of her life? We will. 
Will you journey with Zoe to discover the wonder of God's love made manifest here today? We will. Brilliant. I'm glad that you got right between the we wills and we will do. I have a vow for the congregation, for the family and friends of Zoe, Kirsty and Dan. Jesus calls us to welcome children into the full life of our community, opening our table and our hearts to those most vulnerable, offering the wisdom of the ages to all who hunger for truth. I have a question for all who gather here today, and if you're willing to do this, please answer, we do. I don't trust you to get the right answer. Do you see that? <laughs> do you who witness and celebrate this sacrament promise to love, support, and care for Zoe as she is baptized and as she lives and grows in this Christian community? Yeah. Thank you very much. Just give me a second. <laughs> Zoe. I would prefer her with my left hand, but I can do this. In... Don't drop her. I won't, I won't drop her, it's okay. It's okay. Hi, Zoe. It's okay, you can go back to sleep. You can go back to sleep. Good girl. Good girl. We should have practiced this beforehand, but apparently we're not allowed to do this. Zoe Sophia Harper, I baptize you in the name of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. You are sealed with the promise of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit. In this baptism, you have been marked as God's most precious child. Gracious God, by the symbol of water and through the Holy Spirit, we have affirmed your love for Zoe and your presence here with her. We thank you for her for the gift that she is and the gift that she will be to the community. We pray for her, asking that she would always know your presence, that she would always feel your love and would be blessed in all things by the power of your Holy Spirit. We're going to welcome Zoe as a member of the newly baptised into our community as we sing together the ironic blessing She's a member, not just here, but of the wide world Christian church. Wherever you go within the church, Zoe, you will be known and loved as a follower of Jesus. I'm going to pass you back to your mum and dad, who are going to walk around uh, the church with you. And as they walk, we're going to sing together. The Lord bless you and keep you. You got it. Zoe, I, I trust you were welcomed <laughs> as you went around, even though that you don't know anything of it, but you are most truly welcome here. You're loved. It's great. Dan has asked me if I would invite anyone that wants to take a photograph of the four of us 
to quickly come up and take a photograph and then the Sunday school maybe has something for you Zoe. So we, should we just kind of stand up here a bit? Yeah, you can stand up here. Don't, don't worry, I'll <laughs> A little go from the side so you know. More than I expected. <laughs> my, my, my agent will be in touch for my royalty fees later. Sunday Club have something for. Thank you very much. Ooh. That's great. Zoe, I think you're able to escape with your mummy if you want. And, or, well, I can take those. And as we do this, I, I think I'm going to pray just before the Sunday Club leave for your time. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of sharing in your baptism. We thank you that you mark us as belonging to you and seal us with the promise of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that this is a promise not just for babies, not just for new Christians, but it's for each and every one of us who know and love you. We pray for Zoe, asking that she would know you each and every moment of her life that she would be surrounded by love and care and would be comforted by your presence. And for us, as we go to Sunday Club and as we enjoy the rest of this church service, we ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to be with us, that we would have fun and that you would help us to draw close to you today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So boys and girls, I trust that you will enjoy Sunday Club together. The reading today is from 2 Corinthians, that being the second letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth. It's from verses 1 to 10 of chapter 2, which is 1159 in the Pew Bible. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you, for if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did so that when I came I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy, for I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. 
Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. Amen. We stand as we are able, singing together hymn 485, <coughs> Dear Lord and Father of Mankind.
seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. This morning, as you can all plainly see, there are two ministers at the front, and I thought it would be rather good if rather than have one of us drone on for far too long, you maybe heard a bit from both of us. So I phoned Alistair and suggested this, and he said, good, as long as we keep it short, only about 40 minutes each. <laughs> So that's the plan. I will say a few words about the text that we've heard and give a bit of a, a chat about the main topic and an introdu introduction, which of course is forgiveness today. And at the very end of the 10 or 15 minutes, Alistair will conclude and in the middle, we'll have a bit of a chat. Hopefully that makes sense and hopefully it works. Um, if, if not, forgive us. <laughs> It will become clear to you what we're doing as we go. Uh, I don't think either of us are going to offer anything definitive or concrete, just thoughts that we can maybe wrestle with and try and work through, allowing us to reach a better understanding of some of the key parts of what it's like to try to live in a Christ-like way and something that deeply affects our relationship with God. So in the portion of the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth that we had today, 2 Corinthians 2, reading from the chapter 2, reading from the first verse, what was going on? What was Paul going on about? Well, it would appear in a very earthly sense that Paul was being heckled by somebody in the church at Corinth. An individual was questioning Paul's authority and his thinking. And that's good and right. But it appears that somebody may have been shouting something offensively from the margins in what they were saying and the way they were going about it. I think maybe the first time it happened, there will have been an opportunity for Paul to respond in a way he could deal with the concerns that were being raised and a conversation could follow. But if it happened once, it maybe happened a second time and a third time and no such effective exchange was happening. Paul continued to be undermined by this heckler, and rather like what happens with persistent hecklers at a comedy gig, the rest of the congregation at Corinth turned on the one shouting abuse from the margins. They became restless and turned on that person, and, show, and so ensued following this, there was a very powerful demonstration of grace and forgiveness instead of adhering just to the strict letter of the law. Rather than the heckler being treated as one who is to be shunned, Paul was advocating quite the reverse. In the spirit of the prodigal son's father, Paul is calling on the people to embrace and not ostracize this person. Were they to ostracize, and they might have felt that this was justifiable, they would have lost the chance to be loving and they would have lost the chance to be reconciled with the offender. Living in a gospel way is a risky business. Loving folk that are maybe not the first we think of as lovable is quite difficult. We might find ourselves rejected or humiliated or hurt by those who we are trying to love. But if we love in the face of provocation, if we forgive rather than build walls, then we might find that we enable new life and new hope where there was danger of being none. So I thought I'd start by asking what it is to forgive. For me, forgiveness is tied up in reconciliation. Forgiving is not about saying that behavior is acceptable. It's not about just tolerating somebody. It's not about trying to blindly forget something. It's an act of love that says we would rather live a life together than one in which we are tied up in and burdened by and separated on account of the weight of anger and hate. All the biblical models of forgiveness are about reconciliation, as shown by Paul in that letter. He seeks to engender a place where love and hope for each other are the aim. Alistair, what do you think? Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Dan. As, as I was thinking through these things and where we might go with this, 
the, the old proverb um, that comes from society that to err is human, to forgive is divine, popped into my head. The Bible in so many ways is, as Dan said, a story of reconciliation. When you think about what was going on in, in the story that we have about the fall in Genesis 3, relationships get torn apart. Whether it's the relationship that humanity has with, um, with God whether it's the relationships that we have between one another or the relationship that we and God has with creation, they all get torn apart in the account that we have in Genesis 3. And the rest of the Bible story is, is God saying, look, this is how we're going to sort this out. This is how we're going to call back to one another. So to forgive, forgiveness is, is what God does. That's God's model in terms of bringing all of creation, all of us, back into the fold. Restoration. And as Dan says, it's not a, a willful forgetting of, of what's gone in the past. It's actually saying that this is a hard, hard thing. This is painful. This has hurt me. But being with you and for you is more important than putting up those walls holding up those bridges, knocking them down and saying, look, you're, you're not part of my life. Forgiveness is saying that, that love is more important, that the person that has hurt us is still a person that deserves to be loved and embraced and brought back. How about what it is to be forgiven, Dan? Do you, do you have thoughts about that? I mostly think about when I was a child. Um, just before the service began was me and my dad were standing chatting to the choir and one of the choir members asked my father if he was behaving and he said no and then one of the other choir members probably quite rightly said his son takes after him then and I think back to what I was like as a child, and it's probably reasonable for you all to assume that at times I was an utter horror. I'm not now. <laughs> but in all of that, the overriding message that, that came from my mum and dad, and it's one that I'm hopefully going to be able to pass on to Zoe, is I love you. And that sense that when you're wrestling with something and you maybe behave in a slightly odd way out of character or your character gets so caught up in the problems around you that you maybe lose sense of who you are. But somebody is still saying to you, I love you. Mm. That kind of, that, to me, that's kind of what it feels like to be forgiven. No matter what you think of yourself, somebody is repeatedly saying to you, you are worthwhile everything about you or everything you experience might be difficult but for you as you are you are loved mm. and it's a difficult thing and it's a complicated thing to kind of live out but it, it's that simple enacting of love trumps any way that we can be otherwise yeah i, I would agree for me um, to be forgiven is is all to do with that Christian word that's so easy to say but so hard to get our heads around, that of, of grace. That element of being given a gift that you know that you don't deserve. Like you're sticking your hands up and saying, Look, I've messed up well and truly. I'm not in deserving of, of being right with you again, but I'm still going to ask it anyway. And that grace is that moment of love that says, you know what, you're right, but I love you come here and that is just such a, a privileged position to be yeah. in to to stand before someone and uh, people will tell you that I am I'm very quick to say sorry and um, those that know me will will think oh, he's saying sorry again does it does he truly mean it and it's right sorry they say is the hardest word to say and it's true to an extent sometimes we say sorry just because we think it'll get us out of a circumstance that we don't really want to be in or um, just to end a conversation. But when we say sorry and mean it and find someone saying it's okay, 
that is just such a place of absolute blessing. I, I, I think the, that that really is. And there are those odd moments, and it, it's a very kind of tied up in the grace of God thing. And that grace echoes through many of the faces that I can see here in my own personal experience and all, I'm sure, in actual born out experience. That there's times when God and other people call to us and say, whether you want to say sorry or not, I still love you. Mm -hmm. Come here. And I, I think that's the thing that we have to try to emulate, to live in a Christ-like way, to live trying to emulate God's character, trying to be forgiving people who themselves know forgiveness. It, it's that trying to reach beyond and not thinking, ah, oh, yeah, I forgive you because you can do something in return or it's just nice to forgive you. It's trying to be outrageous in our forgiveness, yeah. trying to echo that outrageous notion of God's love. And of course, we don't always get it right. But hopefully, even when we're trying and we get it wrong, we are forgiven. Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, there's a lady that I, I've once visited in, in a church where I was chatting with her and she was talking about how she had well and truly messed up her life from any way of looking at it that was the only conclusion that you'd come to and I asked her do you think there's any way that you could come to forgive yourself mm. and she was like no my heart broke for her she was thinking back for things 20 30 years ago that had bound her in chains really because she didn't know the forgiveness and as a, a Christian I, I believe that the forgiveness that we need is found in Jesus that God speaks to saying to us look even if the world is not willing to embrace you I am that is that is the message that we see in the prodigal uh, son story that you've mentioned mm -hmm. already it's what Jesus shows in the cross isn't it when he um, says forgive them for they know not what they are doing but it's not always easy. And I guess, Dan, like, like me, you've been faced with circumstances where someone has come up to you and said, will you forgive me? I, and I've gone, <laughs> well, I know I'm meant to, <laughs> but it's tough. It is. And it's hard. But I think we are, to be honest, say to the person, look, it, it's hard to forgive, but equally, knowing as Christians that we're, we have resources beyond our imagining a God, from God rather, who is able to provide us with the strength that we need to help us do it. He is both our model in terms of following what we do, but also he is um, the one that gives us the power that we need. Do you have anything else to say on the topic of forgiveness? <laughs> No. 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 Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't sure. But it, it is interesting because uh, just as we were having the baptism, I was reminded that in so many um, spheres of the Christian Church, the sacrament of baptism, the act of baptism, is a reminder of forgiveness, of God's just drawing close to us. In fact, I once heard a minister. Um, saying that the act of baptism was like the Holy Spirit coming down and giving a gentle kiss on the forehead of, uh, of a young person or of a, an adult being baptised. And I love that because that is a message of, of forgiveness, of, of things being right, of things saying, look, I, I'm going to embrace you. Everyone wants the hug of Zoe, don't they? Absolutely everyone. Even I do, even though I'm petrified I'm going to drop her or she'll get hold of the microphone or whatever. But that desire to hold and care for Zoe, that's the love with which God draws close to us. That is the forgiveness that we can know. And forgiveness is vital in any community. Forgiveness is inseparable for love so we should sing of the love that is beyond measure beyond excelling so number 519 love divine all loves excelling and if you're able i would invite you to stand as we sing
Our uh, offering for the work of the church, both at home and abroad, is uplifted. The choir will sing an anthem that Forrester has picked especially for the occasion. They will sing Child of Mine. And let us pray. Father God, we bring you these, our offerings, as we bring you to the transfers that proceed through the banks, and we bring you ourselves, asking that you take our money and our lives, our gifts and our talents, and use them to and for your glory. May they be used in this church and further afield so that in practical acts of kindness, your love might be seen. And that in the words that our mouths share, your glories might be revealed. We thank you that you have given us the gift of prayer. That we can come into your very throne room and bring the urges of our hearts to you. We thank you that the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. We thank you that even now, Jesus Christ is also praying for us. And we ask that you would be at work in each one of us as we have need. We bring you our cares, our worries, our burdens, And we ask that in you we would find the strength that we need. We bring those situations where we're finding it hard to say sorry. When we know that we should. When we know that we're in the wrong. But we don't want the world to know. We bring those situations where relationships are torn apart. We ask that you, the God of reconciliation, who is working to restore all things to himself, 
might restore those relationships. We ask that you be with, at work within us. Change us more and more into the likeness of your children. We pray that you would be at work within others too. Help them to become the people of God you're calling them to be. We pray that you would teach this world to hate war, to turn their backs on it. We pray that you would be at work in those areas where there's not enough food, where water is hard to find. May there be a sharing of resources and may all in this world receive the money that they need that will enable them to buy what is needed for life, for existence, for thriving and growing. We pray for our leaders, asking that you would be at work within them. Guide them in the paths that you've called them to walk in. And may the way that they govern our country be a blessing to those of us who are inhabitants of it. And we pray for this church in this place, asking that it would have a powerful witness to the surrounding town. Be with us in our relationships with our friends and our neighbours. Help us to live for you, to show your justice, to show your love, to show your mercy. We pray all this in Jesus' name, asking for his help. Amen. Amen. Before we sing the closing act of worship, I'd like to remind you that we're through next door. In, is it the Chalmers Hall? It is. Chalmers Hall for a celebration together. We're going to sing though, however, number 167, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. And if you're able, please stand.
to love and serve the Lord. And may the blessing of Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest, remain and abide with you all now and forevermore.